Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to worship tonight at St. Paul's. It is a joy to gather together around God's Word. And today we'll see that God's Word works. In every single one of our lessons, we see God's Word um, like a seed getting planted. And the power is all in that seed, all in that Word. And, and fruit appears, growth happens, change happens all through God's wonderful word. So uh, good to gather together here. The word of God also gives us peace. So today our first, our opening hymn is When Peace Like a River. Uh, we'll sing that together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has taken away all of your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus, he has removed your guilt forever. 
You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. In the peace of this forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. O God, protector of all the faithful, you alone make strong, you alone make holy. Show us your mercy and forgive our sins day by day. <clears throat> Guide us through our earthly lives that we do not lose the things you have prepared for us in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. In our first scripture lesson, we see the results of the word being scattered and being preached and the fruit and the growth that happens as a result of God's word from Colossians chapter 1. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven, about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In this way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned of it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. This is God's word. The psalms were made to be sung, and we can sing a version of Psalm 92 together. The words will be on the screen. If you'd like to follow along with the musical notation, you can find that on page 101 in the front part of the Red Hymnal. But you go. 
May your priests be clothed with righteousness. May your saints sing for joy. Alleluia. you to please rise for the words and works of Jesus recorded in our gospel lesson. The gospel lesson for today is recorded in Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 26. Jesus also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seeds on the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of heaven is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when it is planted, it grows. And becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you. may be seated. Not a lot of kids in here with us today, but maybe there's some watching online this week. This is the service that we record for, for people watching online, so welcome to you too for worship. Um, I brought with me in this bowl some, some seeds, maybe a little bit bigger seed. If you're gardeners, you've probably planted some very, very small seeds. If, if you remember what it was like only a couple weeks ago when we had a lot of rain before this dry spell came, but my family, we had planted grass seed all over, and then it rained, and it rained, and it rained, and the grass came up. I wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't doing anything about it. But this thing that looked dead, that looked worthless, can have a chemical reaction inside of it when it's on this ground that often looks dead, and hard, and growth happens. <laughs> this thing that just looks miraculous happens. Jesus tells us about that too. He said that, that maybe sometimes, definitely sometimes, this, this thing that doesn't look very exciting or important, this thing that is the seed, this thing that is God's own word, the gospel, doesn't look like much. Words spoken to people Broken people, speaking to other broken people. Speaking to people maybe whose hearts are hard and there is no spiritual life there. And what happens? Faith. Growth. Amazing things. Fruit, starting with something so small and leading to something that is so wonderful. So, uh, we'll get rain here again. And until then, keep on watering your garden. And when you see that growth happen... Those seeds sprout and things happen. Remember, God's word is like that too. Might not look like much, but it's powerful. Let's pray and thank God for that. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your powerful word. On this Father's Day weekend, Lord, we also thank you for faithful fathers who have planted that seed of your word inside of us so that we too can know that you are our loving father. 
Help fathers everywhere to plant those seeds of your word among their children, their grandchildren, and all the people around us, and help us share your powerful word too. Amen. We'll continue with the sermon hymn, God of the Prophets, these three verses. Grace and peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That last hymn we sang, um, that maybe you have heard that before, or you, you know when that's often sung. It's often sung at, at an installation of a new pastor, or on call day at seminary, talking about people going out and being proclaimers of the word. But it's true for all of us, isn't it, that we are called to proclaim that word. And we'll see that today how God's word works through the prophet Jonah. That's our sermon text for today. Jonah chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. It'll be on the screen. It's printed on page 7 also. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose up. From his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. This is God's word. Can you imagine being in a position kind of like Jonah? 
Someone called to be a missionary. To go out into a foreign land and share God's word. Because that's what, what Jonah is called to do. He's the first missionary in the Old Testament going outside of Israel. Well, what kind of thoughts, questions, or worries would be going through your head if you knew that you were going to be going along uh, as a missionary or helping a missionary overseas? Maybe you'd think, but huh, will I be able to learn the language if they speak another language over there? Am I going to, to know the customs? Am I going to embarrass myself while I'm over there? Maybe depending on where in the world you're being sent, you might think, am I going to be in physical danger while I'm there? It's going to be difficult. Uh, a handful of, well, maybe not a handful, two or three people from my seminary class got, got called to go and serve in foreign mission fields, and I'm sure that was daunting. <laughs> but it was daunting for me, too, getting called to, to the United States, knowing I'm going to go and be a pastor, and what if, I, what if I mess it all up? What if the people don't like me? It can be daunting, but every year at seminary, before that call service happens, there, there's always a worship service involved, and there's always a sermon in that before they tell you where you're going to go, and really, although the sermon is always different, the theme is always similar. Don't worry. God's word works. Be faithful with God's word and speak that, and you're probably going to mess up over and over, but speak God's word, and it'll be okay. He'll do the work. And that's what we learn from these sections of God's word we've seen today already, isn't it? That God's word is powerful. Uh, today, as we look at these true Bible stories from the Old Testament, we see an example of just how powerful and amazing God's word is. Is. So, did you see the miracle? <laughs> did you see the extraordinary miracle in this section from Jonah chapter 3? Jonah gets called by the word of the Lord, a direct call from God Almighty, who says, go to Nineveh and proclaim the message that I'm giving you. And Jonah obediently gets up, he obeys the word of the Lord, he goes to this great city that, that would take three days to make his way through all the, all the neighborhoods and see all the people, this, this city of more than 120,000 people, maybe as many as 500,000 people. And he goes there, and he goes, and he preaches. He preaches God's word, and you saw what happened, right? In one day, on the first day, the Ninevites Repent. They turn away from their sin. The king issues a proclamation. They, they have sorrow over sin. They pray to the Lord for mercy. And God works in their hearts in a big way. God's word works. God forgives their sin. Wow! That should always be what happens when we hear God's word too, Right? It should convict us. It should shine a light in our hearts and show where we failed. The Ninevites repented, and the Bible says that they turned from their evil ways and their violence. Maybe we think about how, does, how, does, how do evil ways, how does violence show up in our own hearts? Maybe with Father's Day coming up, we can even think about it in that kind of uh, context. If perhaps you've, like me, gotten angry or uh, upset. How, how does that kind of violence show up in your own life, whether it's physical or maybe just like explosive anger or hatred sometimes with, with the kids in your life or the people in your life? The violence and anger kind of like the Ninevites had. Or maybe you can control your temper well, and, and maybe it's just hatred or anger or envy that just seethes in your heart, even though nobody else really knows what's going on there except God. Well, here we have God who we see hates evil and violence. And the Ninevites had it right. They said maybe he will, maybe God will relent and turn from his fierce anger over sin. The Ninevites had it right. God has fierce anger over sin and will punish the unrepentant sinner who doesn't turn away from that. 
So we too turn and repent. And God gives us the forgiveness that we do not deserve. That could be the only lesson we take away from this section of God's word. And it would be a good lesson. But I hope that after church, some of you would come up to me and say, Pastor Nelson, isn't there more to the story of Jonah than that? It's not just look how bad the Ninevites were and, and they changed. Go and don't be like the Ninevites, but also do be like the Ninevites. Don't, don't be bad and violent like them, but do be repentant like them. Isn't there more to it than that? And there is. Because what we're jumping in, we're, we happen to just be jumping into Jonah chapter 3. And there's two chapters that come before it. And there's one chapter that comes after Jonah chapter 3. And you can kind of see from the, the picture that we've had all over the screen the screens and on your worship folder, um, the first thing that people usually think of with Jonah is the very big fish <laughs> or, or, or the whale. Hebrew doesn't have a word for whale. But you remember what happened with Jonah? In the first verse of our text, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. You, you might, if you're familiar with, with the story, remember what happened the first time that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. God comes into the scene. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah and he says, go to this great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message that I want you to proclaim to them that they need to turn from their evil ways or, or I will destroy them. Their time is up. And you remember what faithful Jonah did, right? He ran away. He fled. Uh, Nineveh is to the east and he goes west. He goes over and he books a, a ship and he goes to Tarshish, which is all the way across the Mediterranean Sea, all the way over to Spain. He runs as far in the opposite direction as, as people in Israel knew of at that time. He runs away from God. Not the great and faithful prophet who's coming and obeying God's will and sharing God's word in such a wonderful way. And then God sends a storm and and he identifies that he's the reason why God is sending this storm. So he has the sailors throw him off the boat. And then that giant fish comes and really saves Jonah from death. Swallows him up. And there he is in, in the belly, in the, in, in the mouth of this fish for three days and three nights. And he starts to come to his senses. And he starts to pray to the Lord. And then the fish vomits him up back onto the dry land. Probably around the same place he started. And then we get to chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. <laughs> Go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it that message that I give you. Let's try this again. <laughs> Why did Jonah run away the first time, do you think? Why did he run away when God told him to go on, on this missionary trip? Didn't he trust that God's word was powerful? Maybe. Was he afraid to go to this land of Assyria, to the Ninevites, to this capital city of Nineveh? Think about that. Let me give you a little bit of context on the Ninevites. This is, uh, the, the people in the city are part of the Assyrian Empire. This is the empire who would, in not very long, a generation or two probably, they would come down with their mighty army and they would wipe out the northern ten tribes of Israel. And Jonah was a prophet to the northern ten tribes of Israel. This is a dangerous people who would spell the end for the northern ten tribes. This was a people who had a, a dangerous, fierce, violent reputation that preceded them. And they, and they made sure the propaganda went out so that people were shaking in their boots if they would come. There's archaeologists have found uh, reliefs on walls, drawings of, of what the Assyrians did to Israelites in the Battle of Lachish. And they have, in those, in those drawings on the walls, they have the, Israel, or the, the Israelite commanders being skinned alive by the Assyrians. They have them taking the commanders, and while they're laying siege to the city, the people that they've captured, they're impaling them on poles out on hills so that people can see what's going on and surrender. These were dangerous, violent people. And here is Jonah, and God tells him, go and tell those people, stop it. 
God says so. If I'm Jonah, I'm scared. <laughs> and it's not a short walk over to Assyria. It's, it would take Jonah, if he starts on the coast of Israel, it's going to take him a good 20, 25 days. And what a long walk that would be. I'm going to go to this great city that I've never been to with hundreds of thousands of people who do not like me, and I'm going to go and speak God's word to them. If I was Jonah, I would be scared. Because of these People, will God's word work with a recipient of his word like that? But God's word does work. <laughs> he starts proclaiming on day one, and what happens? Everyone repents. The brutal king of Assyria gets down off of his throne, takes off his royal robes, covers himself with dust and ashes and sackcloth. And Jonah didn't even get to him. The word just spread. It went viral and it came to him. And then he urges the rest of the city to do the same. Even the animals, don't give them food and water. Let, those, let the cows be mooing loudly. Let all the people just be groaning and praying and crying out to God that we've changed. And maybe he will repent. Maybe he will Forgive us. And God does. He forgives them. He shows mercy because God's word works. His word is powerful. Perhaps there's another application for us. God's word is powerful. It doesn't depend on the receptiveness of the human heart. Because if someone is not a believer in Jesus, their hearts are not receptive. They are all enemies of God, yet God's word is proclaimed and God's word works. So we don't have to be afraid to share the gospel with anyone because his word is powerful. We can do the simple things like grab the, the 507 soccer camp uh, flyer that's inside of your bulletin and go and hand that to a neighbor and Pray that God's word will work as we share devotions with those kids, as we follow up with families that don't already have churches who come and, and check that out. And by God's grace, his word will work. Maybe sometimes as you share God's word with others, it will be scary. Maybe you will be rejected. Maybe it won't be a, a, a miraculous looking thing like it is for Jonah, but remember who is with you, and remember what you're doing. You're sharing God's word. Because God's word works in spite of the receptiveness of the person receiving it. The power is in the word, not, not, not in the person and how ready they are for it. But that's not really the point of the book of Jonah either. The main point isn't for us to turn away from violence like the Ninevites, or to have courage when sharing the word with dangerous people. If you would skip the last chapter of Jonah, if you would just take out Jonah chapter 4 and stop right here, Jonah looks like a repentant hero, doesn't he? Yeah, he ran away from God at first, but God called him back, and through that, that time in the fish, he had some time to think, he had some time to reflect on God's word, he had some time to pray, and when he was spit back out, he was a changed man. And he came and he followed God. Except that there is Jonah chapter 4. <laughs> and in Jonah chapter 4, you realize that Jonah wasn't afraid of the Assyrians. He wasn't afraid of going into enemy territory and sharing the gospel with them. Why did he run away? It wasn't because he was scared. No. It was because Jonah knew that God's word works. What? Really? Yeah. That's why he runs away. This is how Jonah chapter 4 starts. This happens right after the end of our text where it says God was compassionate and he did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. He saw how they turned in repentance and he forgave them. And then the next verse goes like this. But to Jonah, all this seemed very bad. And he, was, he became very angry. 
He prayed to the Lord, Lord, wasn't this exactly what I said when I was still in my own country? That is why I previously fled to Tarshish. Because I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in love and mercy, and you relent from sending disaster. So now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than live. Jonah hates the Ninevites. He sees them as his dangerous enemy. He hates them, and he wants God to send fire and brimstone upon them and wipe them out. But he knew that if God sent him with his powerful word, God might forgive them. And he hated that. He hated them, and he hated how God works. This is the one time in the Old Testament where where this phrase that's repeated eight or nine times in the Old Testament about God being compassionate and gracious and full of, full of abounding love is used in a negative sense. That's who you are, God. I knew that's who you were. And I don't want it. I don't want to live with a God like that. Just kill me now. Maybe that, maybe that helps us understand um, Jonah's prophetic message. His entire sermon... Uh, The only part of prophecy in the book of Jonah is five words long in the Hebrew. So if you can memorize it, you can say that you know an entire prophecy of of, of the Bible in its entirety. And in Hebrew, it goes like this. Od arba'im yom vaninaveh nebachet. You have to add a little in there too. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now, it is possible that this is just a summary of Jonah's message and that he said a lot more to them, that that he didn't just say 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. Maybe he spoke more of God and, and his grace and he urged them to turn. But based on what we know of Jonah, maybe he gave the bare minimum to be able to say, all right, God, if I have to, and what still happens? God's word works. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. You will be overturned. Yet 40 days. And maybe there's a hint of gospel there. Maybe there's a hint of good news there in those first words. Yet 40 days. God has not turned his back on you. God is not destroying you right now. 40 days. 40 days of grace. 40 days for your heart to be overturned before you are overturned. And God, through his word, overturns the Ninevites. Not by destroying them, but by leading them to repentance. And that's what repentance means. It is a turning. A turning around from going on a path that would surely, in 40 days exactly, end in destruction and turning them toward God, toward the forgiving Lord who would give them peace and forgiveness and life, even in spite of a proclaimer who didn't want God to do that. God's word works even in spite of messed up, sinful proclaimers. Oh, and there's peace in that. (laughs) There's peace for me and there's, there's peace for you because I think there's a little bit of Jonah's attitude in all of us. We're not perfect proclaimers of God's word. And perhaps it's possible that sometimes we don't share God's word because at the heart of it, maybe we don't want God's word to work like Jonah. Maybe we like the idea of evangelism, but we're uncomfortable with it because that might mean change. Perhaps that'll mean different people that don't look like me or act like me or have the same kind of a background as me coming in. Maybe I will be outside of my comfort zone if God's word really does work. Therefore, I'm just going to sit here and be comfortable. Perhaps there's a little bit of that racism that is definitely in Jonah too, where we don't want to go and face-to-face talk with and invite and share and love people that are different from us. Perhaps it's okay with us that God loves our enemies, 
but that God wants me to love my enemies? That's a step too far. The only way for our hearts to be overturned is to look at the heart of God and what he's done for us. Through his powerful word, he shows us what he's done for us. Look at the king. Look at the one who ruled over the entire city, no, ruled over the entire world, and see what he does. The one who ruled over a world of sinful, horrible people where God could have said, 40 more days, and it's over. The one who did say, the soul who sins will die. But the king of the universe got off his throne. He took off his royal robes and covered himself with the dust and the ashes of living in a sinful world. He replaced the royal robes with robes of mocking before he went to the cross. The one, the king in whom there was no need for repentance, no violence, no selfishness, no hatred, no, no racism, no sin. This king left his throne. He left his city. He was impaled on a pole, lifted up on a cross for the whole world to see. This king took the punishment that all of us deserved for the attitudes that look like the Ninevites or the Jonah. Here we see God, the one who has fierce anger over sin and is full of compassion and grace. And here we see how this can be possible only at the foot of the cross, where his fierce anger over sin is poured out on Jesus, so his compassion can be shown to you and all of this world, because Jesus forgives those sins. And just like Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days, Jesus says, I will be in the heart of the earth for three days. His body was taken down it was placed in the tomb, and as Jonah was spit out by the fish, the tomb couldn't hold Jesus in. The, the stone is, is rolled away, it's thrown away, and Jesus is once again alive, proving that your sins have been forgiven and washed clean and giving you the power to go and be a true prophet, working with Jesus and his true and powerful word. Jesus has equipped us with his powerful forgiveness and his word, and God's word works. Even in spite of the receiver of his word, even in spite of the proclaimer of his word. And that's good news, because I'm going to mess it up, and you're going to mess it up. Jesus isn't. We can have comfort knowing that the gospel works even with messy people, even in, in messy churches that don't have it all together, even in messy situations. It works for us, through us, despite us. And that can give us calm and peace and patience and grace to carry out all of our ministries, whether it looks possible or not. God's word works. Amen. Please rise. Let's confess our Christian faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page 7 or on the screen behind me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing. Oh, uh, actually, no, we have the Wells Connection, so you can sit down. We'll, we'll see what's going on in our synod um, in the Wells Connection. If you are watching online, we have uh, ways to give the offerings online and continue to support the ministry of the church there. And folks who are inside the church here, if you could fill out the connection card, there's extra pens at the end of each row inside of those leather-bound 
books, you can also use the QR code here or on the back of the bulletin to fill out the connection card online so we can um, have a record of your visit and thank guests for worshiping with us too, share more information, leave comments, and uh, if you're online, there's a connection card online you can fill out too. Let's see what's going on in the Wells Connection. I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Wells plants home mission churches in North America to meet people's spiritual needs. But at times, as believers, they also address physical needs. The COVID era has presented many opportunities to serve both the spiritual and physical needs of hurting people searching for answers and help. As a boy, Reverend Seth Hawkinson grew up just a few steps away from the Mexican border. That immersion in Mexican culture was great preparation for his current role as home missionary at Emmanuel Lutheran in Waukegan, Illinois, a city that's nearly two-thirds Hispanic. Now that I go back and look at it, I can see how God had us move there and had me grow up in that environment because I feel very much at home with uh, Hispanic culture here in the United States. As the community around Emmanuel began to change, members saw the need for Hispanic ministry at their congregation and received support from Wells Home Missions to call a bilingual pastor. This home mission welcomed their new neighbors and created outreach efforts aimed at building trust in the Hispanic community. And he explained it to me in Spanish, you know, and I, I feel comfortable because I knew I can ask and I knew he would answer totally to I can understand him. And that has been, the, I think, the game changer for us in, in that he's working closely with these individuals in their homes and uh, has a relationship, a personal relationship with them. We're going to be following uh, our minute morning praise. As the COVID pandemic took its toll, Members at Emmanuel offered gifts to help those in the congregation who were ill or out of work. But they wanted to do even more. And so they requested and received a pandemic relief grant from Wells Home Missions and Wells Christian Aid and Relief. The funds helped members like Janet Yang, who after hospitalization needed short-term help paying her rent. That will be in my heart forever. I was deeply touched. That is. I could see Christ-like character in that. Pastor, give me the truth, trust me, uh, you need help. Um, I never before <laughs> uh, say something to somebody else where I, I need the support, no? For the people who receive help, the gifts are reassurance that they are not alone. That their local congregation and their brothers and sisters in Wells want to help with their needs here on earth and their ultimate need for a savior. When I see the look on people's faces as they receive uh, aid, and these are real, real instances of real need. I think it's putting our money where our mouth is. It's loving not just in words, but also in deeds. In this church, you feel like a lot of support and, and people care about you. I'm looking forward to get Sunday and get ready and be here because, I don't know, it just makes you feel peace and make you feel so good. Yes, I like it. Emmanuel was one of 24 home mission congregations that received pandemic relief grants. Learn how other home mission congregations are creatively serving their communities with the saving message of Jesus Christ at wells.net forward slash home missions. Please rise for prayer. We'll include in our special prayers a prayer for fathers. 
Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them the rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Heavenly Father, bless all earthly fathers as they seek to fulfill your calling that you've entrusted to them. Give them loving hearts and sound judgment to exercise godly family leadership. May they daily take to heart your admonition not to discourage or embitter their children by treating them harshly or unfairly. Help them instead to bring up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. In loving Christian fathers, may children see reflections of you, the Father whose love for us is perfect and complete. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated for our final hymn, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Take the cross off. Oh, Jesus. 
out of death to life. Well, thanks for trying that with me. We planned an outdoor service for tomorrow at 10.30, so I thought it'd be fun to have the guitar ready for that. Um, maybe we planned the outdoor service just, just so that it would rain on that day, and we'll get, we'll get some rain if it's thunderstorming, which, um, you know, we kind of pray that it, that it will. We could use that. Then we won't have an outdoor service. Uh, we'll come inside, but may, maybe, it'll, maybe it'll be nice and cool, and we'll be outside for the 10.30 service. Uh, we shall see. But if you definitely want to be inside, if you're watching online, you probably aren't because you just finished watching the service, but if you want to get here, 8 o'clock, we definitely will be inside. Uh, some announcements. One of them is after the announcements, we'll be sure to play a quick one-minute video from our, our treasurer, Brent Sexton, and our congregational president, uh, Travis, uh, Travis Stewart, kind of directing us to information about our next 100 mortgage appeal and the information that's in the back corner by the elevator there. A happy Father's Day to the fathers who are, who are here and to those watching online too. You also have, as I mentioned in the sermon, those uh, 507 soccer camp flyers inside your bulletin. Take that, hand it off to a, a grandchild, a friend, a neighbor, and there's a little bit sturdier uh, paper stock postcards on the back table too. Grab a handful of them if you can and share them with the uh, people in your life. Also want to be sure to announce that our annual congregational meeting is happening next Sunday at noon. There's going to be a meal before that. We invite everybody to come to that. And if you look in the news and notes, you'll see uh, what the main things we're going to be talking about at that meeting are. There's some other uh, great information in the news and notes, so I definitely encourage you to check that out as well. I think those are my announcements. Anything big I'm missing? All right, I look forward to seeing you on the way out. Uh, say hi to the people around you. Hello, St. Paul's Congregation. My name is Travis Stewart, our, our Congregational President. I just want to call some attention to some very exciting things we have in the next 100 campaign. Uh, if you haven't taken a look at our chart, it's back here in the, uh, the, the corner of the narthex. We've already been able to exhaust a, just an amazing amount of our mortgage debt. Um, so I'd like to pass some things over here to, to Brett um, so he can talk about some of the numbers and specifics. So great news, and when you come over here, you can see how much we've raised already. So shy of 107,000, and just a tremendous blessing. As we move the needle down on our principal on the month that's owed, we'll see this number continue to rise, and this one voting out. So um, a lot of the details are all here. So I encourage you, after at whatever service you go, swing by and look at all this stuff. A little background on some of the pledges. We've had uh, 12 pledges that have been fully committed. Twelve people have already given their, their pledge to complete it. Uh, we have about 24 people that have been at least fi almost 50%, and there's 50% or 24 people that have yet to uh, start their pledge. So, a number of tremendous blessings. We wanted to give everyone a quick update on some of the numbers. But like I said, again, after each service that you're at, please swing by and check because this number does change, and that's a wonderful. 